Dr. Shristi Jain. She is uh, an associate professor and additional director ECMO at uh, Mahatma Gandhi Hospital, Jaipur. She has got a vast experience of ECMO during first code of ECMO at Heart and Lung Transplant Center at Manchester. She is uh, an equity research analyst and NISM 15 certified personnel and has got many original research and book chapters to her credit. She is a great teacher for uh, the ICCM candidates and uh, teacher for DM critical care as well. The core areas of interest is to finding Ikigai in empowering humans to understand communication skills, to understand end of life care and palliative care. She is having an immense, immense experience of uh, self-finance management. I would hand over the <coughs> mic to Dr. Shristi Jain for the next session. Thank you so much, Dr. Anand. Um, I'll just share my uh, screen. Yeah, and let me put it on the slideshow. Right. Um, is the screen, uh, screen visible? Yes, it is. All right. Okay. So, uh, good evening, everyone. And uh, thank you, uh, uh, Dr. Anand, for your uh, warm introduction. And uh, this is like uh, one of my favorite topics, uh, ERAS protocol. And uh, I'll uh, try to do a little justice to it in uh, the 15 minutes being provided to me. And uh, I am not here to teach ERAS. I am here to sensitize our uh, young doctors, our young surgeons about ERAS, that why ERAS is so important. And uh, I would like to start my presentation by sharing like what is ERAS protocol. So enhanced recovery after surgery protocols, they are multimodal perioperative care pathways, which are designed to achieve early recovery after surgical procedures by maintaining pre-operative organ function and reducing the profound stress response following the surgery. The ERAS is a model of care introduced in 1997 by a group of general surgeons from Northern Europe, uh, which were led by uh, Dr. Hendrik, Hendrik Kellett. And these protocols include evidence-based techniques to minimize surgical trauma and post-operative pain. They reduce the complications, improve the outcomes, and decrease the hospital length of stay while expediting recovery following the elective procedures. So uh, this is the chart of uh, ERAS protocol, which we have uh, made recently for our uh, surgical ICU at Mahatma Gandhi Hospital. And uh, this is like one pictorial view of what are the components of ERAS. So talking about the pre-operative components, we'll be dealing with the components uh, later on, but just to introduce uh, the pre-operative components of ERAS are pre-operative counseling, pre-operative assessment about nutrition, patient's exercise status. Uh, the patients are uh, told to have no solid foods after midnight but they can have some light food till after, till uh, even six to eight hours of surgery. There should be a short pre-op fasting time till two hours of surgery. They are allowed to have oral carbohydrate drinks. Initial prophylaxis of nausea and vomiting, like pre-operatively only a scopolamine patch could be you know stuck to the patient. Carbohydrate loading till two hours before the surgery. Patients are taught exercises before the surgery. They are doing the spirometry, the lung function exercises um, already. And the interop components are regional anesthesia preferred over IV opioid analgesia. So in the form of rectus sheath block or subcostal tab block, right? Or uh, uh, classical tab block or bilateral four point tab block, depending upon the incision. No bugs to avoid SSI. That is maintaining a normothermia, that is avoiding hypothermia actually, so putting warmers to the patients if they are really cold or coming from uh, the theatre. Oxygenation, uh, try to keep FiO2 of more than 0.8 for one hour. Antibiotic prophylaxis, uh, Dr. Pramod has already discussed very nicely in detail about the antibiotic prophylaxis. Underventilating, keeping an ETCO2 of more than 38. Glycemic control, skin preparation of chlorexidine and no shaving. Then um, short-acting sedatives, right? Avoiding benzodiazepines, minimally invasive surgery, like laparoscopic surgeries are preferred over open surgeries. 
intra fluid management so it is goal directed fluid therapy uh, we avoid normal saline as we always say that there is uh, little normal about the normal saline so uh, trying to use balanced salt solutions and uh, goal directed fluid therapy basically like looking at the electrolytes and uh, looking at the hemodynamics urine output and not giving a fixed formula of iv fluids avoiding hypothermia again during the intra uh, period early ambulation early removal of foleys early removal of drains post operative maxi modal analgesia non opioid analgesia giving dvt prophylaxis early oral nutrition so these are all the components of eras protocol and in the next few minutes we will try to realize that why eras protocol is so much important for the surgeons so we will be discussing about the guidelines for perioperative care in elective colorectal surgery which were uh, published in 2018 and uh, alf gustafsson is a swedish surgeon and uh, he has given a very insightful talk on eras protocol which is there available on youtube and uh, i've uh, jotted down the link to the youtube presentation of his and i think this is the most insightful presentation of eras i've ever heard i remember me preparing my uh, presentation for eras a few months back and uh, dr ravi suggested me to hear this uh, uh, presentation on youtube by dr ulf gustafsson and uh, the most uh, beautiful part of this presentation is like he himself is a surgeon and how he uh, takes us through so i i take permission to talk through his slides uh, for my presentation today so who are the top surgeons you know and this is very interesting that whenever uh, when a study was conducted and the surgeons were asked that uh, do you think you are a top surgeon so 95% of the surgeons think that they are amongst the best 5% now initially we might uh, laugh over it but then if we actually go into the depth of it imagine me being a surgeon and me feeling that i'm not in the top 95 i'm not in the top 5% how would i gain confidence to perform a surgery the other day so that is why maybe it's kind of a you know self fulfilling prophecy or kind of a mantra where you have to tell yourself okay i am in the best 5% of the surgeons and i have to really perform very well you know i have to save lives of the patients so uh, the top surgeon has to feel that way so let us understand how you call a surgeon a top surgeon what matters most either the surgical skills or the clinical judgment by clinical judgment we are talking about use of evidence based medicine interest in perioperative medicine and the truth is that no surgical skill in the world can make up for the lack of clinical judgment so this is how uh, the surgeons think 95% of think uh, they think that they are among the top 5% so technical skills so comparing the top 25% of the surgeons to the bottom 25 of the percent of the surgeon this was a study published in NEJM in 2013 so the results were the least skilled surgeons had nearly triple the rate of complications 14.5% versus 5.2% and the least skilled surgeons required longer operative period right so this is what they found but for 75% of the surgeons the difference in surgical skills mattered very little minor importance for the post operative outcome then is it okay if 25% of the surgeons consider themselves as belonging to the top 5% the answer is no clinical judgment so interest in perioperative care use of evidence based medicine that is what makes you a good surgeon so if you are amongst the top 75% of the surgeons the difference to the outcome of your patients would not be made by your technical skills it would be made by your practices following the clinical judgment following the eras protocol and your evidence uh, interest in evidence based medicine and following the perioperative care so what is eras for the surgeons now on the x axis and the y axis here so on the y axis we are having um, the outcome on the x axis we are having uh, the skills that are required and this is what truly eras is about your technical skills are just tip of the iceberg 
and what really would make the difference the 90% of the chunk which will you know have an impact on the outcome would be the eras items what we just read about in the first slide so it is your eras items that would be the predictors of uh, the success right so this is something which we really have to uh, remember now let's go back some years back you know 30 years back when there were there was no eras uh, it was a fast track era most of the studies on eras were uh, done in the field of colorectal surgeries and at that time you know there were no surgeries so colorectal surgeries are the major surgeries and risk of complications are more and uh, if we were following the traditional care because there was no perioperative protocol open surgeries were done there was slow recovery high morbidity long length of stay no documentations were there and even if the documentations were there there would be a huge amount of bias because they would be done by the surgeons themselves the morbidity would be anywhere between 10 to 75% and uh, doctors are the ones which are recording the complications so obviously the you know outcome uh, cannot be measured and the surgical stress would be more and this led to a very long length of stay so um, dr ulf shares in his video that uh, he was working in a swedish hospital in 1998 where there was a non era sort of fast track era and the surgeons were skilled but there were no peri operative protocol they were skilled surgeons but not following the protocol so they had no clue about the morbidity and uh, the length of the stay for a colon surgery was anywhere between 14 days he also happened to work in a hospital in uganda in 2001 in the non eras era and what he found that the surgeons were obviously very skilled they had immense case load and um, they they were operating far more patients in one day that were being operated in any good hospital of europe and but what would happen despite the patient load uh, the peri operative protocols were ignored and malnutrition was rampant fluid overload was uh, overloaded and um, there was no clue about the morbidity and they had very uh, lengthy hospital stay even up to 30 days there was a length of hospital stay and then the first data on eras came from denmark in 2000 and the surgeons were skilled peri operative protocols were followed and the morbidity was recorded and the length of the stay came down to as less as 2 uh, days and this was one landmark paper which was published by the founder of uh, eras uh, dr gellet and uh, they found that if you were following the eras protocol in the traditional surgeries the length of the stay would be like around 10 days but in fast track surgeries the length of the stay would had come down to as good as 2 uh, days which was uh, really uh, impactful and in the recent eras data uh, the eras guidelines what they found that uh, 30 day mortality eras was safe mortality was reduced morbidity was reduced risk reduction was reduced by 47 to 48% shorter length of stay was uh, noticed and readmissions day uh, readmissions were less in the patients who were treated following the eras protocols so eras protocol why is it very very important see we need to understand that surgery is a stress surgery brings in stress in the forms of cytokines adrenaline noradrenaline cortisol is released there's lipolysis a uh, glucose uptake is uh, reduced there's insulin resistance there's a uh, glycogenolysis gly gluconeogenesis all this leads to hyperglycemia oxidative stress and which in turn lands up the patient into a vicious cycle where there is more release of uh, cytokines and eras items if we follow you know all the eras items we cannot exclude anyone we have to follow them as a bundle maintain compliance do audits in our institutes that whether are we able to follow the eras protocols or not and we find that you know it reduces the surgical stress it reduces the cytokines adrenaline noradrenaline and the cortisol and hence results in early recovery of our patients so Uh, in uh, the eras protocol effect we find that the functional capacity of the patient you know it comes back uh, very soon as compared to the conventional treatment if we follow the eras components like multimodal uh, interventions for pain relief exercise feeding stress reduction so uh, the functional capacity and the recovery is very 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 much better so eras items and evidence level so is there an automatic correlation between a high level of evidence item and a high impact when used within the full eras program so one way to find that is compliance right uh, there are still 
lot of there are still not lot of much of data about the compliance on the eras and that is why we as the young budding uh, anesthetist surgeons and intensivists you know it is very important for all of us to conduct studies and to understand and uh, see in our own units that how much are we compliant with the eras components right and then we will understand that how it improves the outcome so this is one of the studies which tested about uh, the compliance and the overall compliance which they found in their study was around 71% and what they noticed were that um, uh, nearly all of the pre peri and pre operative eras items influenced the different outcomes in a beneficial way independent predictors of outcome were whole directed fluid therapy and uh, carbohydrate uh, fluid uh, you know before give, uh, before two hours before the surgery another study was done and uh, in this study the independent predictors of outcome were uh, doing a minimally invasive surgery like laparoscopic surgery early oral food and early mobilization and the overall compliance was found to be around 60% so to conclude we say dr rolf has said in his uh, youtube video uh, on the eras platform that eras for a surgeon to summarize that make sure that you are at least belonging to the top 20 75% of the surgeons make sure that you practice evidence based medicine and enhance recovery surgery currently you have to use all items in the eras protocol this is what the research has shown us so far and we should regularly conduct audits and check for the compliance of the eras in the institute so this is to summarize about what he had to feel about eras and i would still say that it is one of the best talks that i have ever heard on eras and um, another recent talk which uh, i heard on eras was by dr paul wishmeyer and uh, he is the uh, author of uh, american society for enhanced recovery and perioperative quality initiative joint consensus statement on nutrition screening and therapy within a surgical enhanced recovery pathway and uh, he is a surgeon he is also an anesthetist and uh, luckily i happened to meet him very recently in one of the conferences and uh, i think i have heard such a beautiful talk after a very very long time in my career his uh, talk made me cry his talk made many of the doctors sitting there cry so the talk was not just about him sharing experience of two of his patients the stories uh, related to the recovery after a surgery his story also spoke about him so malnutrition is an emergency in hospital and surgery uh, this is his talk which um, uh, i happen to hear that and he says that malnutrition is an emergency in surgery mortality in gi oncology if the well nourished patients is around 4% but if they are malnourished if they happen to have 20% weight loss uh, the mortality can be as high as 23% and the reason why we cried during his talk this is him he himself was diagnosed as uh, inflammatory bowel has suffering from inflammatory bowel disease in his young college life he's underwent 25 surgeries himself he has hardly any bowel left when he came to give the talk in that conference he had the stoma bag and he is still managing still traveling everywhere around the world he is still a tango dancer he is uh, an excellent bodybuilder he is a personal trainer in the gym for uh, many people such an inspiring story that was and in this picture this is him in july 2014 with his nice abs and muscles and this is him in august in 2014 after his surgery he lost around 12 kg of weight and immense muscle mass in just two weeks of surgery so this is what a surgery does to our patients and that is why eras is so very important when it comes to the recovery of our patients them going back to their life then them going back and having a normal routine they going back to uh, their work their jobs becoming an independent member of the family again so uh, we have now enough data to suggest that eras is very very important eras saves life and it decreases the length of stay 
and um, lowers the complication rate and very importantly we need to understand and we have to give up our old traditional ways of practices unlearn the old ways and learn the new ways so eras protocol includes that no bowel preparation before the surgery early ng tube removal early enteral feeding early ambulation and no opioids and this is again another infographic of a published study in jama in which uh, they did a study on uh, 80 elective colorectal surgeries and they found that at 30 day after surgery patients with the highest eras compliance had less moderate to severe complications so again coming back to the components of the eras which we enlisted in the beginning right i just want to touch upon the few eras points which we fail to accept even after 13 years of evidence for eras why we still are not able to adapt them and unlearn our old practices so in the pre operative component we all understand that you know we don't need a longer fasting time we can give carbohydrate rich fluids to the patient even until two hours before the surgery this will decrease the insulin resistance this will prevent hypo and hyperglycemias and this will result in better um, infection control of the patient right again pain management is very important we need the uh, um, we can give oral acetaminophen to the patient before the surgery oral gabapentin in selected patients oral cyclooxygenase cox2 specific inhibitors for selected patients uh, we have to give thromboembolic prophylaxis with uh, subcutaneous heparin 5000 units 30 to 60 minutes before the surgery and in the intraoperative components uh, something which i really want to um, stress upon is um, use of minimally invasive surgical approach whenever it is feasible antibiotic prophylaxis first shot 30 to 60 minutes before the surgery use of short acting anesthetic agents inhalational are preferred uh, over the iv avoidance of fluid overload so whole directed fluid therapy not just a fixed rate lung protective mechanical ventilation maintaining normothermia glycemic control multimodal antiemetic uh, prophylaxis like dexamethasone uh, induction after the induction of anesthesia on densetron at the end of surgical procedure for patients who are at very high risk of post operative nausea vomiting we can give them a third antiemetic like uh, scopolamine or intraoperative iv haloperidol and we also have to think about avoiding the intra abdominal or perineal drains yes again this is again our norm which we have been doing so we have now enough data to tell us that if it is an elective surgery if there is no pus or an infected fluid the patients don't need drain it won't result in any betterment so no drains no gastric tube right early removal of the foley's catheter all these should be considered in the post operative period so enteral nutrition should begin on post operative day one yes day one you don't need to wait for the return of bowel sounds high caloric supplements twice daily multimodal analgesia again use of tab blocks or opioid sparing pain medications multimodal antiemetic regimens early removal of foley's and early mobilization programs making them walk even on the evening of the procedure so i would just like to stress upon early nutrition that now we have enough data to suggest that early post op nutrition is associated with significant reduction in total complications compared with the traditional post operative feeding practices so we have to give up the practices of nbm crts the patients don't need rice tube after elective surgeries always uh, they they can be fed orally most of the time see we are not talking about the exceptions we are talking about most of the elective surgeries of day in and day out and uh, and it does not negatively affect the outcome such as mortality or anastomotic dehiscence again it is against the common belief ki we will feed the patient the patient can have anastomotic dehiscence no the thing is that if you start feeding the patients your gut will be more healthy the gastric juices would be used because anyways we are producing 1.5 to 2 liters of juices just in our saliva and upper gi tract so removing them and causing uh, electrolyte disbalance uh, doesn't make sense in today's era uh rather feeding the patient would resume the bowel function and would rather decrease the length of the stay so um, yes uh, let's be the doctors who follow the evidence based medicine another important myth 
that why we don't start feeding our patients early is we wait for the return of the vowel sounds the truth is that location of the vowel sounds so vowel findings in one quadrant may not localize to that quadrant as sound frequently travels along the entire abdominal wall and length of your listen so if you're not able to hear the vowel sounds do you have the patience for waiting as long as 50 minutes because cycles of vorgereming last as long as 50 minutes while the patient can have up to a 4 minute of absent vowel sounds so are we ready to wait auscultate in each quadrant wait for 4 minutes each so ideally it would require at least half an hour to 40 minutes if we really want to listen for the vowel sounds are we ready to wait for such long so uh, we have now enough data to tell us that vowel sounds are not associated with flatters or vowel movements or tolerance of oral intake after a major abdominal uh, surgery so again coming back to the components of eras that these are the component of eras what will make you as a good surgeon if you are amongst the top 75% of the surgeons is your intention to follow evidence based medicine so um and again it is not an individual effort it is a team effort so when the patients who are the stakeholders stakeholders are all of us the surgeons the anesthetists anesthetists the pain services or a team nursing team you know uh, nutrition team pharmacy team everyone all of us as a team are the stakeholders to make sure that eras is implemented in our hospital so just to conclude i would say that intelligence what is intelligence so intelligence is not because you think you know everything without questioning but rather because you question everything you think you know thank you so much thank you dr shashi for such a nice talk on eras protocol covering iv fluids antibiotics and uh, more or less everything everything a surgeon would be interested in knowing so i had a question for you can eras protocol be followed in all surgeries so yes that's a very good question dr anand so again um, uh, nothing is uh, in isolation so if we have surgeries in which patients are hemodynamically unstable if they are septic patients if they are the surgeries which are done in emergency then in those cases all implementing all the eras items would not be possible and we have to follow as many as we can and maintain the compliance for as many as we can what we can do is what we can do as a team together is to have a eras checklist and to write down the reason every time we are not able to follow a certain item so what will happen we will be insightful okay i'm not able to for example feed my patient immediately because the patient is on let's say a lot of dose of vasopressors but at the same time i am aware my team is aware that as soon as the reasons for which i have not started the feed yet have gone and i start the feeds i slowly and slowly build up upon the feeds thank you thank you for your answer so now, now i would like to move on to our next topic for the evening 